I don't know if you saw, but earlier this week, the governor is now requiring masks in schools, even for young kids. So Meemaw says you got to wear your mask, guys. Uh, governor K. Ivey has extended the, what is it? What, what are we on now? The safer at home orders, I think, is the new moniker for these guidelines. And she actually extended it from July 31st, in other words, tomorrow, because that's when it was supposed to expire, all the way to August 31st, which frankly, was kind of expected. Yes, I'm peeved about it, but I've already talked about how ridiculous the mandate is. The thing that is bothersome to me now is because she extended it and, and extended it into presumably what would normally be the school year, she also added a stipulation that all school children must wear the mask when they are in attendance to school. Now, I'll start off by saying this real quick. Unlike the mask mandate that's just universal to every citizen in the state of Alabama, this is not something that is outside of the governor's purview. I mean, when you consider the fact that public schools are indeed government buildings that are essentially owned and run by the state, yes, they're owned by their local school boards, which are affiliates of the state, not going to get into all the rigmarole there, but essentially these are government buildings, and just like schools can require, for example, children to have certain vaccines, Yes, they can require students to wear a mask. I'm not saying they can't. I'm saying the policy itself is dumb. And that's really the conversation we should be having here. On the regular mask mandate, we need to talk about the constitutionality of it. And I'm talking about Alabama's constitution, not the federal one. On this one, well, that's a moot point because we know that the government can do it. The question is, should they? Because when it comes to school children... These are the people that are by far the safest, and I'm talking about children here, of course. So let's go ahead and look at some stats again, right here out of the state of Alabama, to illustrate the, the point and in, in how safe children are in schools when it comes to this virus. So you can see there that, and this is uh, Alabama COVID stats for people between the ages of 0 and 25. That's just how the stats are counted. So I couldn't get one for just people under 18. So you can see there that of the there are 18,060 cases for people in this age demographic in the state of Alabama, which means that they make up roughly 22.14% of all COVID-19 cases here in the state of Alabama. They make up six of the deaths. Not 60, not 600, six. 0.4% of all deaths in the state of Alabama. They got 22% of the cases, only 0.4% of all the cases in the state of Alabama are people between the ages of 0 and 25. And this is the fatality rate. 0.033. By the way, real quick, hat tip, just a shout out to a buddy of mine that uh, brought this up. Uh, she actually noticed that I put a decimal place in the wrong place and corrected me. A buddy of mine that actually teaches math, a math teacher by trade. So I just wanted to say thank you to Taylor for doing that for me. I really appreciate it. And uh, anytime, if, if any of my stats or anything is wrong on the show, feel free to comment in the section or, or message me and let me know because I want to, I want all this stuff to be as accurate as humanly possible. But anyway, thank you for doing that. This is the fatality rate. 0.033 for people between the ages of 0 and 25 in the state of Alabama. That is infinitesimally small. This means that the, the actual rate of being a... I mean, it's just absolutely insane. That means that if you get this virus and you're under the age of 25, you only have a 0.033% chance of actually getting it. And by the way, this is not adjusted for filtering out people that have some kind of pre-existing condition or comorbidity. This is everybody. This is counting everybody. And keep in mind that it is also counting people that are between the ages of 0 and 4 and people between the ages of 18 and 25, which don't even attend public schools in most cases. And yet the fatality rate still 0.033. It is incredibly unlikely that even if you do get this virus, that you are going to die from it if you are in that age demographic. And if you adjust it for the CDC estimations, because remember, we talked about this a little bit earlier in the show, 
that the CDC has estimated that, oh, actually, that, that statistic is wrong because uh, um, there should be one less zero there. So I apologize for that. But if, if 10 times more people have this than originally thought, then that means that the adjusted CDC estimate is 0.0033. So 10 times less likely than originally uh, postulated there. So to put that into perspective, the CDC's flu fatality rate for the state of Alabama for people under the age of 18 is 0.042. That means that the flu, at least in the state of Alabama for children, is 21% more fatal than the novel coronavirus. I want to let that sink in. It is 21 times more likely that if a child gets the flu that they will die than they are if they get the coronavirus. Now, if you were to look at a different age demographic, because a whole lot of people compare this to the flu, and there's some legitimate comparison there, but it is a different ball of wax altogether. If you are to compare the two, that if you were to look at older demographics, if you were to look especially at people, you know, over the age of 50, well, that number's basically flipped on its head. The coronavirus is actually far deadlier for people in that age group than people are, than the flu is. But the reverse is true for children. The regular seasonal flu is deadlier to them than the coronavirus. That's because this particular virus, the number one risk factor is age. And children, they're not completely immune to it. Yes, they can technically die from it, but it's insanely rare. Even kids with pre-existing conditions and comorbidities, even they have a very, very infinitesimally small chance of actually dying from this thing because of their age. And yet these are the people that we believe we have to throw mask on them and make them wear it eight hours a day. That doesn't make any sense. I mean, just looking at the sheer numbers, it doesn't make any sense. And let's go ahead and, and look at this as well. You can see here that these are some more stats to, to ponder on all this. So the fatality rate, you may recall, we were just talking about this, is 0 0.33. The CDC car accident fatality rate is 0 0.88, which would mean that children are 2.6 times more likely to die in a car accident than they are to die if they get the coronavirus. And that's not just children, you know, th their possibility of getting the virus and dying. That's the rate of children after they already have the virus. So even if your kid, even if you're ignoring the fact that the kids are less likely to catch it, even if they get it, even if they already have the virus, they're already sick from it, they're less likely to die from the virus at that point than they are to die in a car accident. So if you're driving to ki your kid to school, they're more likely to die on the ride there than they are to die after catching the virus at school. The risk factor is basically non-existent here. And that's why, first of all, closing the schools is absolutely insane. But even what Governor Ivey is talking about here, making children mask up. And by the way, there are several school districts that have decided to go ahead and cancel school or do school virtually or whatever. These, a schoolhouse is basically the safest place that you can be just about it when it comes to this virus. Closing them down or forcing people, forcing kids to wear a mask just does not make any sense. The flu death rate in Alabama is, I mean, it's deadly. The flu is deadlier to them than the virus. A riding in a car is two times six more likely to result in their death than getting the viruses. We're talking about an incredibly small risk factor here, and we're contemplating shutting down schools and throwing masks on them for what? Going to school regularly is riskier than doing it here. It just it, it doesn't make any sense at all. Now, the rebuttal to this naturally is going to be, well, it's not about the kids. Because, yeah, the kids are at low risk for 
they're, they're at very low risk of dying from the virus, but what if they get it and they bring it back home to a, a family member, a grandparent, or whatever? First of all, I don't think that it's absolutely unreasonable uh, for if you are somebody that is at high risk for this virus to maybe stay away from kids at that point. But the truth is, I don't even think that that's necessarily something that you have to do, and we'll talk about why here. First of all, there has been absolutely no evidence whatsoever that children have a high rate of catching the disease or transmitting it. They seem to catch the disease at a much lower level than their older counterparts. And remember, like I was saying earlier, when you are the one proposing a policy, you're, the burden of proof is on you to prove it is a good idea. The burden of proof is not on me to prove that it is a bad idea, but I'm going to do that anyway because I have to have something to talk about here on the show. Uh, there's been no evidence of that, and that alone should be enough to end the discussion. However, let's just beat this dead horse as long as we can and see what we dig up on this one. So, first of all, there's several reasons why kids are probably less likely to transmit the disease than anybody else, and the reason that it is so incredibly low. In an, eb an, a in an absence of data and an absence of proof, you could just go ahead and say, well, the burden of proof is on that person to prove it. They can't do it. Let's just walk home. Yeah, you could do that. And that is a legitimate, logical way to reach that conclusion. However, in this particular case, we can ask ourselves why there is a lack of evidence. Because a lack of evidence could, of course, be used as saying, well, then we shouldn't do it. I mean, I could make, for example, some kind of claim that invisible hobgoblins are the actual cause of the novel coronavirus, and what we should do is we should start trying to eliminate the hobgoblins, and that'll fix the problem. Well, you can't prove that that's not true, but you also can't prove that that's very likely either, and the burden of proof would and ought to be on me to prove my theory to say that, yes, my solution might work, not the other way around. It's not incumbent upon you to prove that hobgoblins are not causing the virus. That's how burden of proof is supposed to work. And so, with that in mind, I could just call it quits here and walk away, but I'm not going to do that because I think that actually there's a significant, the lack of evidence actually indicates that this is something that is highly unlikely. Because as much time as we have had across the world and here in the United States, I get that data is limited on this virus because it's, it's newer, but by this point, we've been dealing with this since February, you would think that we would have some data as to whether or not children are at high risk, and we don't. Now, does that mean they can't transmit the virus? Probably not. But that does indicate that they are probably so incredibly unlikely to spread the virus that that's the reason we haven't found evidence of it. I believe that there probably are at least some cases of child transmissions, but they are so rare and so hard to track down that we don't have evidence of them simply because they are so incredibly rare. We have plenty of transmissions that we know about from adults to adults, but very, very, well, absolutely none for kids, not in the U.S. or any other country in the world. There's a, there's a couple of reasons why this is probably the case. First of all, they have very low rates of being symptomatic. So even if kids do catch the virus, there's a really good chance they're not even going to know that they're sick. There's a really good chance they're not even going to experience symptoms or it will be so mild that they think that they're just sick with something else. This has been very common among people that do have the virus. Also, when they do get sick because their bodies are more resilient to it, they don't stay sick for as long, which means you have a shorter window of time where you could possibly transmit the virus. And so that's another way that we can look at this and go, oh, okay, well, you know, there's just a smaller window of time for me to get the virus, and that's probably why they're not transmitting at rates that are that are even significant enough to be observable uh, by our scientists and, and by the studies that we're doing. And then another reason that is quite possible, we don't know if this is true or not, this is just a theory that's being floated around the medical community, but it seems to have some legitimacy, is that nasal ACE2 enzymes in their nostrils, so... The, it, it's an enzyme that works as a receptor for the coronavirus. Kids just have less of it. And so that's probably a factor that you have something that is a receptor that is more common in adults and not so common in kids, which means that there's much less risk for them contracting the virus, even if they are actually exposed to it. It would still have to come in contact with that receptor, and kids just don't have as much of it 
as adults do. So even in the, if they are risking exposure, they're still at lower risk for actually getting it. And if they don't get it, they obviously it's harder for them to spread it as well. And so th those are three reasons, again, not conclusive, but that people believe that children are probably significantly less likely to transmit the virus than other people. But if that's not enough for you, let's go ahead and look at some other countries and how they've dealt with it, because keep in mind that a lot of countries have already reopened schools, and these are the results that they've yielded. You can see these headlines here. Uh, right there, you will see a headline from the uh, Institut Pasteur, which is uh, they, it's a French organization that did this study saying that in uh, primary schools, the significant transmission uh, on children from students or teachers, there was no significant transmission. So that is uh, of note. And then you also have Reuters, which says that reopening schools in Denmark did not worsen the outbreak, according to the data. By the way, it is important to note here that other Scandinavian countries, which include um, Sweden and Finland, reported basically the same thing as Denmark. I also do find it pretty hilarious that the left, which is always crowing about how we need to be more like Scandinavia and Denmark, uh, that when it comes to reopening schools, they don't necessarily believe we should be following in their example, even though their data shows that there was no significant increase in the outbreak even after they did open schools, which... I would have expected there to be some increase and just say, yeah, but the, the risk uh, merits any or the, the reward outweighs the risk. But here they're saying, no, there's really not any risk. It didn't increase the outbreak. And then you see this one from The Telegraph. This is actually the largest study that was done on the effects of coronavirus in school children. Their study found that there was no evidence that coronavirus spreads in schools. No evidence. So again, why are we shutting down the schools if that's the case? What is the purpose of shutting down the schools if every single piece of evidence we have seen so far from around the world shows that this thing just doesn't spread all that well in kids? There's no evidence anywhere in the largest study that's ever been conducted in the world and we're thinking that now we got to mask up every kid in school? Why? Just doesn't make any sense. This is probably my favorite one. And uh, you can see this. This is from a, an epidemiologist. He wrote an editorial for um, The Times. And you can see his work here. Um, th this is based on his work in the UK. And you can see here what uh, the headline is, The School Closures, A Mistake as no teachers infected in the classroom. And now what I want you to do is look at this little highlighted portion here in the very bottom of the screen. Scientists yet to find a single confirmed case of teachers catching coronavirus from students anywhere in the world. You know how many school children there are in the world? It's a lot. I don't know the exact number, but it's a lot. And this epidemiologist that studies this for a living, he's looking at it as like, there's not a single case anywhere. Not one. We can't find one. Anywhere in the world. But sure, because we have to protect the teachers and protect the parents and all this. There's no cases of teachers catching it from kids. Not once. And they're presumably the... the the person that the kids come in contact with the most, they certainly come in contact with more students and more people of that age than anybody else, and yet they're not catching it. So what are the odds that one child coming home to grandma and grandpa is going to spread it to them? I'm not saying it's impossible, but it ain't good. If it's virtually impossible for kids to catch it, they're not increasing the outbreaks, and there's also no cases of a teacher catching it from a kid isn't it pretty darn reasonable to believe that if it's never happened anywhere in the entire world that we know of, that we're overreacting here? I just don't understand why everybody can't look at this and go, well, that's ridiculous. And just, I honestly do not get it. 
And here's another thing, too. I'm, I'm going to go off of the data because this has been a very data-driven segment. And now I'm just going to appeal to common sense. Do we really think this is going to work on little kids? Have you ever watched a little kid? Granted, I'm not a father, so I, I don't spend a lot of time watching how little kids interact. But, you know, I've, I've done babysitting and that kind of thing, and I've watched little kids before. They're not exactly the most conscientious people. I mean, they tend to, like, pick their nose and touch their eyeball, and if they're wearing masks, do we really think that that's going to help them all that much? I actually saw a really funny meme earlier, which is, like, 100% something that a kid, especially, like, a, a kindergartner or a first or second grader would do, that uh, your kid's going to leave home with a Spider-Man mask and come home with a Paw Patrol mask, and uh, then the whole school's going to be shut down the next day, because... That's the thing that's so ridiculous about the, like, they don't get it. They're not, they don't understand germ theory, the vast majority of them. And so to them, that's just not a big deal. The idea that masks are going, like, we can't even prove that masks are effective amongst adults. Do you really think they're going to be effective amongst a seven-year-old that's just not all that conscientious, that can't even keep his hair straight? <laughs> like, this is not an effective strategy for younger kids, at least when it comes to, like, middle school and high school. At least when it comes to that age group, I could kind of see the mask being a little more effective in that setting. But do we really think a seven or an eight year old is going to be conscientious enough to make sure that he's not touching the inside of his mask? I mean, you're an insane person if you think that. I, I just, maybe there's a handful of super conscientious seven or eight year olds that are, but the vast majority of them, no, it's not going to matter. And the thing is, based on the data, that shouldn't make a difference because they're at such low risk of catching it or dying from it or passing it on to somebody else anyway. And another thing that they need to consider, what if a kid has asthma? Or what if a kid really can't breathe with the mask on? Like, this is a thing that happens to little kids. The vast majority of them, it probably wouldn't bother them. But what about that one kid that has a hard time breathing? Uh, I actually know a guy that's asthmatic that can't wear his mask for very long because he actually will start to hyperventilate and, and he has a medical reason and this is an adult. Asthma is significantly more common amongst children. And so what happens to that kid? Ultimately, what this boils down to is, I'm not anti-mask. I'm not saying that masks don't work. I'm not saying that there's no merit to it. I'm not saying that if you don't want to wear a mask, you shouldn't. I'm saying it should be a choice. It should be a choice in society whether you want to wear a mask or not. Now, I might argue that you need to wear a mask, but I'm not going to say that the government ought to force you to do so. I don't want to force what I believe will work upon you. That's how it works in a free society. And when it comes to school kids, when we're looking at this and seeing that there's virtually no chance that this has anything to do with whether or not the kids stay healthy or the people around the kids stay healthy, why would we mandate it to them? If you're a parent and you're concerned about it and you want your kid to wear a mask, tell your kid to wear a mask. By all means, do whatever you want. But don't force it down their throats. There's no reason for that, especially considering that there's no evidence that it would do anything to help. Look, I'm trying to follow the science here. I really am. I do tons of research. The reason that we started late tonight is because I was doing all this research and crunching all these numbers. But at a certain point, you do have to say, even if you are trying to follow the science, and, and that's what I'm doing, that human free will and human interaction and the ability of human beings to make their own decisions needs to be a factor in making these decisions. And so far, we're treating it like it's not. Studies show that YouTube videos featuring attractive women get far more likes and subscriptions than ones that don't. This is especially true if she's exotic looking. Luckily, in the modern era, there's an easy way to work around this. You see, I identify as a very attractive Hispanic woman, so now you have to like this video and subscribe to my channel, otherwise you're just an evil, heartless Nazi that hates brave, liberated, beautiful Latina women like me. Checkmate, woke brigade.